Hello, I'm Dr. Sarah Bone, and if you're new here, welcome. This is the first in a series on the topic of dementia. This subject will be broken into segments because of its importance and the amount of information that is involved with this disease process. There are many kinds of dementia, and until recently, we did not have accurate diagnostic tools for determining which dementia the patient might be suffering from until the disease was advanced. We also did not have good treatment options. The diagnosis is still largely dependent upon history, the risks, and other diagnoses that the patient has. The history of memory change from the patient and the collaborative source is not replaceable. That's information that we must have. We consider medical history, other medical issues, and medications that the patient might be taking. Dementia is not a part of normal aging. This is the beginning of a huge topic, and we're not gonna go into the many types of dementia or how we distinguish one from another at this time, as well as the varied treatment and diagnostic options, because this is such a large topic. All of these things will be discussed later. This is such an important disease process that it really deserves considerable time and consideration. I want to explain a bit about the vastness of this diagnosis. When a person says that they have dementia, it's like telling somebody that you have cereal. You don't know if it's hot cereal, cold cereal, fruit cereal, sugar cereal, health cereal. Dementia is the broad topic, and then there are multiple types of dementia within that broad topic. I'm gonna give a few statistics about dementia to illustrate its importance. Somewhere in the world, every three to four seconds, a person develops dementia. Six million Americans have the diagnosis of dementia right now, and by 2050, it's expected to double and be nearly 13 million. One out of every three seniors has this diagnosis at death. 10% of Americans have dementia in 2023, and 22% of Americans have mild cognitive impairment. In-home care for an aid begins at about $25 an hour. Adult daycare costs are typically about $100 a day, and the low end for nursing home care is about $200 per day. Before we dig in, let's talk briefly about a few brain basics. The brain has a weight of about three pounds. There are three major parts of the brain, the cerebrum, which is where the thinking and movement controls are located, your cerebellum, which is for balance and interpretation of your optic information, and then the brain stem, which is kind of the connector and the location of the autopilot mechanism. Your brain circulation requires about 20% of every heartbeat. The communication of the brain occurs cell to cell by various methods. It's pretty miraculous, pretty intricate, and really complicated. How the brain works is almost mysterious. It's through a combination of electrical charges, hormones, and chemicals that are released or absorbed and that they change those receptor sites on other cells when those receptors or when those hormones or chemicals attach. Dementia is impaired cognition and there are some uh, population predilections that we can talk about. People over the age of 65, dementia affects about one out of 10 of these people. In people over the age of 85, dementia has some effect on about three of 10. There is younger onset under the age of 65. That can occur, but it's less common in that age group. Less commonly, there is a rare but a real risk for hereditary types of dementia. So there's a lot to discuss in this topic of this diagnosis. Dementia, again, is not a normal part of aging. The memory loss is of new memories the brain begins to no longer have a reliable ability to place new information into the long-term memory area of your brain. So think of if you're working on a desktop that doesn't have battery backup and you're working on some files and you unplug it. Some of that information is gonna be lost forever and other files may be corrupted. The information may be there, but it may not be quite right. Let's talk a moment about normal aging versus abnormal aging in the context of memory names or words of things and objects. An older person that has normal brain aging is maybe a little bit forgetful and they have that tip of the tongue phenomenon. They can think of it, it may take a little prompt, they may take a little cue, but it takes them a little bit longer for that information to be retrieved, but they've got that information. Whereas a person with dementia has progressive forgetfulness, particularly of new information. The long-term memories typically remain intact for a long period of time, and typically the longer that memory has been there, the more likely that memory is going to be retained. 
It's the new information they really struggle with, they really have difficulty with. Written and verbal information and directions an older person with normal memory changes is going to be able to follow those directions and instructions. They just may need more time. But a person with dementia and abnormal cognitive function is going to have progressive difficulty following instructions and difficulty particularly with difficult tasks that are two, three, or multiple steps in that task. Let's think about stories on a television program or a movie or a book. The older person is going to be able to follow that information, but a person with dementia is going to have progressive disability with following that information, confusion with the storyline, confusion with the characters and names. For stored knowledge, an older person is going to be able to recall it, although it may be a little bit slower, but the information is going to be retained for the most part. But over time, a person with dementia is going to have loss of known information, whether it's political information, historical information, familial information. Just remember what they did last night or yesterday sometimes can be really difficult for them to retain. Everyday skills that they perform on a routine basis, being in a routine and being in a habit is really good for a person with memory impairment. An older person is going to be able to be able to do those things reliably even if they get a little bit out of their routine unless they're physically impaired. But a person with progressive dementia is going to have more and more difficulty maintaining that routine such as turning off a light switch requires a little bit more uh, awareness than turning it on. Turning off the stove or turning off the oven, as important as those are, can be easily forgotten with a person with dementia. Now I'm going to give some basic information that applies to pretty much all types of dementia. It's not one specific disease, it's a collection of symptoms due to disorders affecting the brain function with thinking, memory, and behavior all becoming progressively altered and impairs their social and working life. That becomes affected as well. It's helpful to have early diagnosis, but not everyone has the same symptoms and the same presentation, so it complicates the identification of the disease process. There are changes in planning, changes in problem solving, and there, those abilities become impaired. They begin to have difficulties completing even everyday tasks as the disease progresses with time. There is confusion with time and place. They can have difficulty with interpretation of what they see, whether it's objects or people. They have depth perception and they can have difficulties with spatial orientation. Many will have difficulties with comprehension of speech and writing. There is a tendency to misplace things with the loss of the ability to retrace those steps. They can't remember how they got there or where they might have put those items. And then when they have retrieval of that item, they don't remember how it got there. So for instance, I'll give a story about somebody who, you know, is looking for something in their house. Maybe it's car keys. And then two days later when they find the car keys, they just pick them up and they don't remember, oh my gosh, I've been looking for these for a couple of days now. They just pick the car keys up. Somebody goes to the store, they purchase their groceries, and they leave the milk in the back seat. And then when they're unloading the groceries, they might think, I thought I had milk. And they're suspicious. Somebody took my milk. And then two, three days later, when they find that bad milk in the back seat of the car, they don't remember getting at the store. They can't remember where that milk came from or how it got there. Other symptoms may include decreased or just frank poor judgment and possibly disinhibition. People may withdraw from work and social activities, and that could be due to embarrassment or they just forgot to go. And the problem is the more they withdraw, the worse the memory can become. One of the most disturbing concerns for families and caregivers is the change in the mood and personality of the patient. People often live many years with the diagnosis of dementia, and these years can have a good quality of life. It takes planning and it takes help. With lack of recognition and avoidance of these early symptoms, the burden to the patient and the family can become significant and the patient can even have the risk of injury. There are many risks for the development of dementia and some are modifiable, but some are not. Age, education, maybe history of many strokes or a major stroke, depression, educational level, blood sugar control, hypertension that's not well controlled, elevated cholesterol over time, 
living alone, male, and there is a specific gene that is related to dementia, the ApoE4 gene, and we'll get into depth in that in a different video. There are a few ways that you can help reduce your risks. Being physically active. Don't smoke, and if you do smoke, quit. Eat healthy. If you drink alcohol, do so in moderation. Be mentally active. Be active with brain training. Use your executive function. Plan a trip even if you're not going to go somewhere. Get out the road map. People still use road maps. Do some math problems. Even simple math problems helps that higher level of function, especially if you can close your eyes and do those in your mind. Being socially active with friends. Play cards. Play dominoes. Learn a dance. Do your best to manage your weight. Do your best to manage your blood pressure, blood sugar, and cholesterol. Don't ignore mental health. If there are issues with anxiety or depression, address those. You should also address and keep current with your eye doctor and if you have a hearing issue and address sleep and sleep apnea. Lack of sleep, lack of proper sleep are detrimental to your memory. There are many similar looking processes that are not dementia but sometimes left untreated, these can result in dementia, depression, medication effects, thyroid abnormalities, B12 deficiency, something called normal pressure hydrocephalus, intracranial bleed or a subdural hematoma, tumors, whether benign or malignant, something called Diogenes syndrome. Think of the withdrawn older person that's a disorganized hoarder. Untreated chronic pain can actually cause cognitive impairment. There are many worrisome but realistic concerns that deserve to have ongoing planning and preparation because of a person with the development of dementia. Money is not the only one, but we do need to plan for the future. One of the concerns that has been brought up because now we have so many diagnostic tests and tools, could insurance possibly cancel because of that diagnosis. We want to make sure that we meet the care needs appropriately to ensure for the safety and the ability of the person to age in place. Planning is so very important. Certainly no one wants to hear the diagnosis of dementia for themselves or for a family member. But learning the diagnosis allows for understanding of the anticipated trajectory. It allows the person to understand what the prognosis might be. There's time for the patient and the family to prepare. They can determine what their preferences are discuss goals of care, and what the patient would find as an acceptable quality of life. The patient has time to select and inform the healthcare surrogate of what their choices would be as the disease progresses. The patient and the healthcare surrogate can discuss goals of care as well as the life-sustaining treatment choices, resuscitation or CPR, mechanical ventilation, artificial nutrition and feeding, and dialysis. And that gives ample time for the patient and healthcare surrogate to learn about each one of these. And the patient can then make a decision to give the healthcare surrogate about how they want to be cared for under certain circumstances. There are times when the patient has decided they would not want to return to the hospital anymore. That at the end of life, they would prefer to be at home, whether or not they would want to continue to receive aggressive care, sometimes even antibiotics can be discussed if they would be appropriate or not. Early discussion of how to know when hospice may be appropriate is also a good consideration for the family and the patient to discuss. And as weird as it may sound, it might be something that they want to discuss about where the patient might want to be at the time the end of life occurs. We want to have timely assessment of the physical symptoms and we want to address the emotional and spiritual needs of the patient and the family. Neuronal damage is the process behind the dementia process. Changes are occurring at the molecular and cellular level in the brain. Cellular impairment and progressive death of those brain cells result in the changes that are happening. Each type of dementia has a specific area of the brain that becomes impaired, and that is the determination of the type of dementia. The brain is an incredible organ, and its ability to learn, even when one cell dies, the other cells around it can learn that task. But if that cell or group of cells contained memory, that memory may be lost forever. Dementia symptoms are dependent on the type of dementia because of that area of the brain that's affected, and that's a video that we'll go into in more detail at a later point. Some of the symptoms of dementia can overlap, but there are specific characteristics for each type. Cortical symptoms, typically think of Alzheimer's type dementia. That's the difficulty forming new memories. They can have difficulty with aphasia or speaking, agnosia, difficulty with placing things and doing things with their hands, and visual spatial impairments. Subcortical symptoms, you might think of vascular dementia, cognitive slowing. 
The memory is there, but it maybe is more difficult to retrieve. They can have impaired memory retrieval and difficulty with attention. They can feel apathy and depression, mood liability, and disinhibition. Suspicion of memory loss or dementia should trigger an evaluation and a workup by your physician. The history from the patient and a collaborative source provide crucial information and a great starting place for that evaluation. As we discussed in lab and imaging basics, it is not possible or reasonable to test for everything. Thus, we must have good information from those symptoms from the patient and the family to guide us with that investigation. Having ongoing involvement with the elderly patient and with the family is so important to aid with that early identification and the intervention. It can make a huge difference in the outcome and the quality of life. Getting the right help at the right time is critical. So what type of clinical history is important? Misplacement of items without self-retrieval. Impaired acquisition or retention of new information. Inability to recall recent conversations. Can the person accurately recall and tell you what happened last night, this past weekend? Can they give you the details of the TV shows that they've been watching? Can they tell you who won the game, what the score was? Are there personality changes? Have they been bathing and changing their clothes regularly? Can they get their clothes in the washing machine and washed appropriately? Has the person picked up some odd or totally out of character habit without explanation? Are they cussing or breaking things or stealing or having car accidents or running out of gas, maybe not paying the bills? Has there been a decline in their ability to perform their own activities of daily living without a physical impairment? Think of our video on the golden hour. Can they perform the activities needed in that first hour of the morning? Getting up, going to the bathroom, getting to the kitchen, getting food, getting clothes on. Can they do those things independently? And it's not, again, because of a physical impairment, but because of a cognitive impairment. The efforts to make the diagnosis requires that good medical history, which is very time consuming and it's done over stages. So it's not usually a one-time event. Typically multiple visits are needed. We have to get information from the patient as well as the collaborative source. There are numerous cognitive and mental tests that are available, and they will need to be monitored again over time. For sure, the patient needs to have a good and thorough physical exam. Lab tests that may be needed are a really good place for starting, and usually with the basics like a blood count, a complete metabolic panel, thyroid evaluation, some vitamin levels, some illnesses that maybe are transmissible either by blood or sexually transmitted diseases such as HIV or possibly even syphilis. Sometimes invasive tests may be warranted. Maybe a spinal tap is warranted. We don't do brain biopsies to evaluate for dementia. Imaging may include some basic tests like a chest x-ray or a CAT scan, but MRI and PET scan can be done as well. And there are many special tracers now that we have, some specific markers that are available that will help us as a diagnostic tool determine the specific type of dementia. Late diagnosis does not really help us because remember, late in the diagnosis, the dementia has advanced and there is a significant amount of brain tissue that has already had damage and possibly many brain cells have already died. And once a brain cell is dead, we cannot bring it back. Disease progression may depend upon the type of dementia. The timing and specific pattern of decline, as well as the common symptoms, can be disease specific. Patients that anticipate to have more rapid decline, if that patient has psychotic symptoms, earlier age of onset, development of seizures, and if there's extra pyramidal features, um, hyperkinetic movement changes, like an increase in the movement, or hypokinetic changes, hypokinetic movement problems. Think of like Parkinson's, stiffness and rigidity. Yeah. Tremor is not necessarily increase in movement or hyperkinetic. It's more rigidity with Parkinson's, but those are still extra pyramidal features. Other symptoms that can occur with dementia can confuse the diagnosis. Depression, passivity, disinterest, withdrawal, irritability, dysphoria, just a generalized unease about something. And sometimes the patient isn't really sure what it is that they're uneasy about. I think sometimes the patient realizes that something is missing, that their memory is declining. They may not want to admit it, or worse, they may not realize it, and they may be hiding it from their family members. They could be tearful, 
They may have sleep disturbances, day and night not being set quite right. They may have trouble with appetite, just not having interest in things and generalized apathy, or numerous somatic complaints. Sometimes the symptom of agitation or anger or suspicion is a tip off to family members and friends that there's a memory problem. Anxiety, changed in facial features or expression, guarding of emotions, tensions. Sometimes there's hypervigilance or suspicion, maybe inattention, resisting care and resisting help and trying to keep secrets. Oftentimes there are various social relationship issues that develop that can be a tip off that there's a problem. The confusion may be episodic and it can worsen under periods of stress. The evaluation of pain and the treatment of pain also brings special issues. The evaluation can be difficult for the family as well as the physician if they're not accustomed to caring for somebody that, that's cognitively impaired. A person that's cognitively impaired often may have an atypical presentation of their pain. The subtle clues and cues that somebody normally sees when pain is early on may not be present and the pain's interpretation by the patient may be impaired. So the history that they provide is not the same as it might have been in the past for an individual. It could be generational. Sometimes older individuals are reluctant to admit pain, but oftentimes we find that it's the interpretation of the brain of that pain signal that's what's really altered. So if you ask the patient if they're uncomfortable or if they're in pain, even though they've got a facial grimace or they're grunting or moaning or holding their tummy or their knee, they may still say no. Treatment of pain in a patient that's cognitively impaired also presents special issues. We'll talk about medications at a later point. Eventually, we will review the medication efficacy, side effects, and safety, but that's a huge topic all of its own. Briefly, medications sadly do not cure or reverse or even prevent dementia. What they typically can do for us is they can slow that progression if we can start them early enough. We want to get that early diagnosis that's why it's so important. Hiding from the change and ignoring it can actually decrease the chances for a longer life with a higher quality. We will also review the medications that are being used to slow the progression of dementia processes. We'll do that with each one of the various kinds of dementia. There's not a one shoe fits all, one medication treats all dementia. The key for treatment is early diagnosis so that the medications can be started and can slow that process from the very beginning. That being said, we don't wanna just give a medication without a very good reason. That's foolhardy just to take a medication just in case, and it also exposes the patient to way too many other risks. Early dementia signs can be subtle and easily shrugged off. The person may have occasional forgetfulness, missing an appointment for something, leaving an item behind, a change of their regular routine. They may not recognize those changes, possibly a behavior that's out of character for them. For now, mostly we use some simple screening tests at the beginning. We follow those over time to see what and how it changes. Recall of three to five objects immediately, and then again at five minutes. We, one of the exercises we do is the clock draw, saying the months of the year in reverse order. Recall of a random name and address. We may ask them what time it is is approximately now and not let them look at their watch. We may have them identify some various shapes and we may give them a test where they have to identify various animals. Progression to mid-stage of dementia is marked by insidious progression and decline of that memory. They become suspicious of others. They can have more written and verbal language impairment, agitation, maybe restlessness and wandering will begin to occur. And then that day-night disorientation begins to be noticed. Sometimes they can have aggression that becomes noticeable. They may even have delusions or hallucinations that begin at the mid-stage of dementia. Risky behaviors can begin to occur in some patients, but not in everyone. There may be wandering. They may try to leave the home and not tell anyone. There could be sexually inappropriate behavior. They may begin rummaging and going through things. They might start hoarding and sometimes even stealing can occur. Agitation symptoms might begin to emerge where there's verbal agitation of yelling or moaning or crying, a belligerent attitude. But the most common thing noted with the verbal change is the repeated questions, asking the same thing multiple times. Motor function problems begin to occur. Pacing, fidgeting, being restless, having sleep issues, and then psychotic symptoms can occur. 
delusions, suspiciousness, and hallucinations. Signs of progression to severe stage of dementia can include total dependence for all activities of daily living that's not because of a physical impairment, hallucinations, minimal or unreliable memory remnants, restricted verbal skills, becoming incontinent of bowel and bladder, seizures may occur at severe stage of dementia, and feeding issues. If they haven't begun, they will be noted here. Evidence of dementia reaching the terminal stage, the patient can become bedridden with skin breakdown, and skin breakdown can occur for multiple reasons. The patient can become completely uncomprehending, not even understanding a simple one-step command on a routine basis. They can become near vegetative state. There's dysphagia with recurrent pneumonias often noted, and weight loss. Basically, it's general multi-organ dysfunction. If you think about it, a computer that's not working, the brain is your master computer and all of the organs communicate to each other through the brain. Sometimes they just work on autopilot, but oftentimes they work as a unit and they coordinate with each other. There are special concerns that arise that are difficult, if not completely impossible, to prevent, treat, and manage. Pressure sores is one of those. And I know if we've got an individual who is physically impaired, pressure sores we in, in the hospital and poor nutrition, we need to make sure that we're helping that individual turn in bed. But sometimes an individual who is fairly functional during the day can become really unable to even turn her over in their own bed and can need help at night. These pressure sores are contributed to by poor nutrition, the decreased activity, and the brain and body are not communicating correctly to provide for that natural movement to prevent those wounds from occurring because they've laid in one position too long. Sometimes you might have you know, been laying in your recliner and you've had your legs crossed and then when you uncross them you notice there's a red mark, but you don't get a pressure sore from that because your body told you to uncross your legs. But a person that has a cognitive impairment problem may not get that information because remember their interpretation from their body of the pain signal is not getting through correctly. That neurologic dysfunction prevents them from even realizing that they're in a bad position and they're developing a tender area and then the skin will break down. They have risk for dehydration and loss of that natural instinct for thirst. They become nonverbal. It could be intermittent or ongoing, but it is progressive. They have increasing infection risks, whether it's a skin infection from a wound, their um, upper respiratory tract, or possibly a pneumonia, and then bladder infections. The infection risk goes up for these individuals. There's dysfunction with their immune system to fight off common things. The inability of the body to manage and maintain its own homeostasis becomes impaired, and part of that is just because of the computer not working. So their temperature their pulse, and their electrolytes can all become out of regulation. Our treatment goals include to maintain or improve the quality of life. We want to delay the need for assistance. We want to prolong a patient's ability to meet their own needs for their activities of daily living and maintain their own independence. We want to allow the person to age in place. We want to ensure for a no harm environment or at least reduce the harm as much as we possibly can. If we've got a frail elderly person already that's at significant risk, we don't need to add more burden to them. We want to manage overuse or underuse or inappropriate use of medications and procedures that can add to a person's risk. Sometimes medications that a patient has been taking for many, many years and they were told you'll always need to take this, they don't need to continue to take that or maybe they need a lower dose. Might consider some of those medications that may need to be reduced or even eliminated at some point in time. In summary, the diagnosis of dementia is huge, and we have so much to discuss to cover this topic. It's a big category of diagnoses with tremendous impact on the patient, the family, and society in costs and the resulting changes in the person. Realizing that your own memory is declining and that you can't live by yourself or in your own home for some reason is the worst thing to happen imaginable for most people. It's very humbling for a family to witness a loved one or to have those changes occur over time in their own family. We all want to do everything that we possibly can for the early identification and treatment of a dementia process. These are a few more tips that might help you with your brain and memory to help keep it sharp. Reduce or eliminate the substances that may damage your brain. Alcohol, illicit drugs, smoking. Challenge yourself. Think and test yourself on what you did and what you saw yesterday and the day before and last weekend. 
If you're watching TV, try to recall the commercials or the recent TV news program. Talk with friends and family often and recall recent events with them often. Read and stay mentally active and try to keep learning. Try to learn one new thing every day. All these things can help strengthen those brain connections and can help promote new connections in your brain. Treat anxiety and depression. Brain chemistry improves when you feel better. Relax because tension can interfere with your cognitive function. Get good sleep. Eat well. Use a notepad. Keep a calendar. It won't necessarily keep your memory sharp, but it can certainly help assist for when you have a memory lapse, and it can also help decrease your stress. Take your time when you're doing tasks. Organize and declutter your life. Use a special place for your items. Put your glasses in the same place every day. Put your hearing aids or hearing aid batteries in the in the same place. Keep track of your house key. Keep track of your car key. Repeat the names of new acquaintances during a conversation multiple times to help you remember that name. Stay active and work to keep your physical skills up. Walk. Practice getting up off the floor. Stand on one leg when you brush your teeth, you know, leaning on the counter. Hop each morning, maybe a few times on each leg, you know, hold on to the wall or something for balance. So I want you to live each day to its fullest. I want you to take care of yourself. Take care of your family and friends and neighbors. Keep the kind and mankind. Thank you for your time today. If you have a question or a comment, drop it in the comment section below. Please continue to watch for more breakdown on this important topic. I appreciate you. Thank you. Bye now.